Welcome to another episode of our series on expedition planning and in this video we're going to talk about selecting the right team members to join you on your own vehicle adventure. Welcome back to Driven to Extremes. I'm Mac McKenney from Max Adventure. We're expedition specialists with 25 years experience of operating vehicles in the most extreme environments on earth. I'd like to introduce you to Steve Holland from SJH Projects who I've known for many years, but the reason I've asked him to join us on this particular video is that he ran the selections for the very first expedition that I applied for. So I'll hand over to Steve and he can explain to you what that was all about. Hi. Um, yeah, that particular one was uh, one. In the end, it, it it didn't come off, but it was for Land Rover's 50th anniversary, and they were going to go from sort of west coast of Ireland uh, all the way to New York, sort of overland and over water with the uh, George Channel, English Channel, Bering Straits. We first ran the selection for mechanics from within Land Rover, and we got two good guys. We needed a third and it got opened wider through the RGS and sort of things like that. And then a bunch of ne'er-do-wells turned up and we took them to Plassey Brennan and ran them around the hills, got them tired and um, gave them interesting things to do. And um, yeah, you were one of the ones to, uh, to come out of the process. So how did you meet Sir Al Fiennes in the first place? Right, I was young when I had hair and Ran had hair. Uh, I was at BAE Space Systems in Stevenage, where we actually made communication satellites and parts for the Ariane rocket. And they were a sponsor and then the sort of manufacturer for amphibious polar sleds. And this was going to be Rand's first expedition post his big transglobe, which is where he sort of really made his name. And it was for unsupported attempts to go from land to the North Pole. So no airdrops, no resupplies, no vehicles of, of any form. And he did set a number of records uh, closer and closer, but in the end, it didn't make it. Though the years that he was doing that, which were the second half of the 80s, were quite bad for the ice pushing back south from the pole and creating pressure ridges in Canada and then in Russia. But uh, yeah, so it worked with him for quite a spell over a number of years on, on that project and then it sort of carried on from there. I know that most of the stuff you do as your day job is classified but can you give us a, an overview of um, what, what you actually do to earn a living? Engineer but have found myself working in the field of explosive blast protection so there are some standard products we have like letter bomb containers and moving detonators but we do a lot of stuff for the underside of vehicles against IEDs and a lot of, of testing of blast protection systems, you know, glazing, litter bins and whole vehicle systems themselves. So some government work, a lot of industrial work, consultancy, and it's, it's a real sort of a mixture. But essentially it's you know, engineering and problem solving, but in, a, in an interesting niche where you get to go and blow things up in the name of science. A lot of the vehicles that you're working on obviously are heading off to a very extreme environment. So this obviously is a is an area that you know very well. Yeah, the you know, we've done stuff that is used by the military, but also sort of NGOs operating in post conflict areas, and that that's all around the world. You know, high altitude, heat, um, you know, rainy seasons in Africa. All of these sort of places are where the equipment has to perform and survive and the, and the people operating it have to perform and survive. So it tends to be uh, people who need this stuff aren't needing it really in um, central London in nice residential areas. So when it came to Sir Anil Fiennes asking you to run the selection course on which I was chosen to join the, the Transglobe expedition, um, how did you learn your trade of, uh, of, of running such selection courses? 
When, well, as an army brat, so I was brought up around the army, uh, 13 schools and however many houses. And when we moved back to the UK from Germany, I thought, well, these people have no sense of humour. Um, so while at BAE, I went and um, joined um, Tempower, which was a London-based um, territorial battalion, no longer exists, so an exclusive club. And um, at that stage, where the, from those who sort of turned up on, on day one, there were 48 people and there were three of us who ended up with our, our wings at the end of it. Um, it was about four years after the Falklands, so there were plenty of candidates and they could just sort of destroy people and see who was left. However, a couple of years after I joined, I was on the training wing and we learned to be a bit, a bit smarter and apply a little bit of psychology and a bit of better preparation. And it's sort of where I learnt really the skills of getting people to do more than they thought they could. Because a lot of the limitations are actually, um, they're in the mind. And um, I mean, obviously the fitter you are, the you delay the point of, at which you rely upon your uh, willpower. But ultimately, it's going to need your willpower and um, a bit of a belief that you can actually do these things. And uh, we've got quite good at getting people to uh, to outperform their own expectations. So for those of you who are maybe watching us from overseas, uh, when Steve refers to para, he's referring to uh, the parachute regiment, one of the elite forces of the British Army. So clearly this guy's work with the best of the best. So training them and selecting them is, uh, is something that Steve knows well and therefore is perfect to talk to you about how you should be selecting your own team members. So I know you've also been involved with other elements of expedition support. Can you give us an overview of uh, some of the other things you've done with the uh, Serrano Fines and other, other expedition teams? Well, as I said, um bit earlier sort of yeah engineering and advanced materials as you would have for satellites and uh, for you know blast protection and things so it's engineering problem solving that has then been applied into the expedition field um, so things like we for a winter crossing of Antarctica developed a bespoke heated clothing system suitable for operating out in the permanent darkness of an Antarctic winter uh, we developed that and then we're testing it in cold chambers down to minus 56 and in the field up in Arctic Sweden. Uh, we have done things like developed a running buggy that you can actually run with, pull along and live in it. Uh, that was sort of followed on from the heritage of the original polar sleds, uh, of which we then did a number of different buggies for people like Rosie Swell Pope, who you know, set off to run around the world on her 57th birthday and, and managed that after a few years. And she's still doing it. She spent her 70th birthday running across Death Valley, uh, towing one of our, our jog pods behind her. And at the moment, she's on lockdown in Turkey um, because she's over 70. She has to be. But she is currently running from London to Kathmandu and her house is being pulled behind her. And she loves it. And um, these jog pods themselves have evolved. They can now come with solar panels and all sorts of little bells and whistles. And there are a few of them out there with strange people doing strange things. So, yeah, it's the fun is doing things that haven't really been done before. That That's that's where it's interesting and that's where it's at. And, and you meet interesting people along the way to help you solve those problems. Which other teams have you run selection courses for um, and which part of the world are they, they heading off to? Well, for RAN, which is where these things started, we, we run selections, but also run actual sort of training programs for him and teams that he has pulled together for things. They, they used to be RAN. I think they're actually going to rerun one of them. But for the Eco Challenge, sort of five days, multidiscipline adventure races. So in that role, we provided the support crew, but also created the sort of scenarios and the challenges um, so that effectively I became the enemy that uh, united the team and gave them a bonding opportunity to hate me, which is fine. 
uh, and we've done those in sort of you know North Wales and the Lake District and here here and there. Um, and in terms of selections and combined with training, things like there's um, a very good charity near um, Andover where they have a mixture of physical, mental, sort of social disabilities going on, and they wanted to do a uh, an attempt on Kilimanjaro. So at their place, we ran the selection process and then we ran their sort of rehearsal on Snowden. That was very good because, again, in terms of getting people to to do more than they thought they could, that was a very good example of that. And and we did filter a few people who perhaps really shouldn't have gone, but they did get as far as Snowden and that was their Kilimanjaro and was a major achievement for them. Other ones are for like a group of rugby coaches who were going to travel down through uh, Africa. We ran the selection for that for the first two trips, um, which worked again very well, very sort of bespoke and, and different. It wasn't an expedition as such, but it was multi countries down the east coast of Africa. And you needed to know that you had a, a motivated set of people who could work together. Uh, one of the biggest ones we ever did, which you were heavily involved in, was the uh, bus to Beijing, which was connected with the um, the red double-decker bus at the closing ceremony of the Beijing Games, where London got to do a 15-minute little splash. Uh, well, what was supposed to happen was a bus was going to leave Trafalgar Square and drive overland to Beijing, driven by London bus drivers. And... Um, from a thousand applicants, I think we had about 36 who we and then through a bigger, bigger gang of people who we know were able to put on quite a adventurous and interesting program um, that put these people through their their paces. Uh, bus drivers are a strange breed, far more interesting than you initially might think they are. Um, and we chose some really, really good people and um, and we gave them then those that were successful, a sort of a, a training phase and they were all ready to go. And then Boris Johnson became mayor and said, I'm going to save money on this and, and cancelled it, which is a bit of a shame because actually most of the money had been spent by then, but it was a, a political gesture. Um, so that was a very large scale, unusual one. And then we've continued to do it for Ones who we think are worthwhile, like Sasha Dench, we did her media crew for the very successful flight of the Swans, who, when she did a paramotor trip from northern Siberia back to Gloucestershire, following the migration of Buick Swans to sort of see the perils that they, they had on the journey. And very recently, we did one for her next project, which was going to take place this year, but obviously now isn't, and it'll be next year which will be fly to the Osprey following newly hatched Ospreys from Northern Scotland down to uh, West Africa, possibly as far as uh, as Ghana. So, yeah, they're an ongoing process and uh, and it's a process we've, we've refined over the years. So having ascertained that Steve is clearly the right guy to advise you on uh, selecting uh, team members for your expedition, if you haven't been on an expedition before or you've you haven't put a team together before. Uh, so Steve, can you tell us what are the pitfalls when it comes to selecting your own team and why have a formal selection process? If you haven't done this before, you are perhaps most likely just to sort of kick off with, with people you know, um, you know, friends and family, if you like, um, and that can cause some real issues. You are the driving force behind this and potentially putting in all the effort. And if you sort of just invite people along because you happen to know them, that can seriously backfire uh, because on the trip, there needs to be a hierarchy. There needs to be a leader and you're it. And that may or may not sit with them properly or how you would like it to. Uh, that suddenly, you know, you are ostensibly in charge and they are are just one of the team. But also, once you're out there, because they have this additional relationship with you that, that predates the expedition, 
they know stuff about you from you know when you were four year old sitting in a puddle eating worms or whatever. Um, they've got stories about you, uh, dirt on you, whatever you want to call it, that even as sort of banter can come out and that can undermine your authority and you need to be careful about that. Also, they might feel because they've known you longer that they're in some way senior to other people who they may get involved later on. So it's just this sort of personality dynamic and you might end up with a hierarchy that isn't the one that you want. Also, it can cause damage to what you, friendships that you want to keep afterwards because they might think, oh, well, you changed when you were the leader. Oh, yeah, you, you, well, you used to be such good fun, but God, you, you were so strict and boring or, or whatever, whatever. Um, and you, know, you might not want that damage to be done. Um, so be careful. Uh, in some ways, it is better to start with a clean sheet of paper and pick people from that background and from that context. Now, it might be a friend who you met through doing this sort of thing. A lot of the mountaineering expeditions came from people who were in climbing clubs. So they effectively were friends because they had the shared activity already. So the context is is there and, and that's all right. But if they are friends or, or say family members without that context, you have to be really, really careful. Um, also, they might think they've got some sort of additional right. It's like, well, you needed people. You couldn't have done it without me and I'm here. And I don't really care that you've done all the work. Um, you know, you need me more than I needed you sort of thing. Um, so you've got to be really careful with that sort of stuff. Also, if you're then going to open it out and choose from a wider pool, um, people from the right background, obviously, they're all the right sort of activity and experience is good. Uh, military can be a double-edged thing people think oh if you're from the military you you know you're you're made for this well yes and no you know the, the military is a very wide church with a very widespread of capabilities and people who've spent their entire military career trying to avoid work you know they're out there just as they are in any other large group of people uh, i mean one thing you will have is they are used to working in a hierarchy and there there is a leader that will be the common thing, but don't just assume that because they're from the military and can spin a good yarn that they're automatically what you need. Another thing to be a bit careful of is your team specialists, um, whether it be a, a doctor or a cameraman or a, a mechanic or someone with particular skills. Again, they might feel, well, you need me because you can't go or get permission without me being there. Um, and it's their ticket to a lot of uh, free rides on different expeditions. Or actually, you need someone who is, uh, you know, plays well with others and understands they're an expedition member first and a specialist of whatever role second. And that's a really important attitude. Um, be very careful that if you are considering running a selection, that you don't pre-select people and let them know that they're pre-selected because they go through the whole process as a bit too cool for school and I don't really have to get too involved in this. And, and you don't see how they interact with other candidates properly. If you're going to have a selection, it needs to be a selection at which everyone can fail. Um, you know, there, there has to be something at risk, if you like, for them to undertake that selection process properly. Um, you might think, OK, I'm planning my first expedition. Uh, I need to surround myself with people who've done lots of expeditions before. Pretty good idea. But if someone's CV um yeah has a, a list of recent things that they've done do check them out really important uh they may this individual may have done a number of trips they may have been a right pain on every one of them um so go and check 
Um, just a quick phone call, a little off the record chat could save you an awful lot of pain later on. You also need to know from your potential expedition members what is their available commitment level. It's not really much good if they say, yeah, I can meet you at the airport on the day we fly off to somewhere exotic. You need to be able to have some measure of their commitment to the project in the build up. And if they can't really commit to that, then that should give you a lot of warning bells in terms of their commitment once you're out in the field as well. So that's sort of like a number of things to be aware of when you are even thinking about sort of setting up a team and whether you actually think you might need any sort of formal selection process. Um, one last one, which is an interesting one, is, um, and it applies on the selection process as well, but certainly if you are thinking, I'll just go with people I know, and that's what I call big personalities people who are like the life and soul of the party. And you think yeah, that will be really great to spend three months with so and so while we're driving across Siberia or crossing Antarctica or whatever. Big personalities tend to balance out and they tend to then have a downside. Um, and their downsides can be just as big as their upsides. And um, that initial impression of he's really fun to be around be aware that uh, yeah, that that other side of the personality is probably there uh, lurking. And um, do you really want to be around it? So what are the benefits of getting potential candidates together and running a formal selection process? Well, we've gone through some of the pitfalls. The benefits are actually pretty good. They're, they're, they will, the investment you make in running some sort of formal selection will definitely pay off uh, yeah way more than the, than just an interview in the in the pub somewhere uh, just to sort of meet someone and, and see what they're like and one of the important aspects is that everyone should go through it uh, even the people who might end up as reserves but then again they might be selected as reserves as a result of the selection anyway so but definitely people who might say I can come but consider me a reserve um, also, you're, if you're going to need a UK operations end, someone back in the UK to be on the phone, to be on the computer, to deal with stuff that, that happens that you can't really deal with in the field, it's actually important that they go on the selection as well, because they're the link, they're an important member of the team, and it's their opportunity to meet and get to know the other team members and conversely for others to know and then have a bit of confidence in whoever's running the uh, the UK ops. Um, it, running a formal selection can also be um, a bit of a diplomatic thing. I know for a fact, because I know who these people were, that RAN has effectively pre-failed people. Uh, there was one on your selection where this person rocked up uh, having done some stuff with uh, Ran in a, in a different sort of sphere, and I was told this person is not to pass. Yeah, so he was beasted around the hills of North Wales and did this and did that, completely and utterly wasting his time. Um, but it didn't ruin any sort of relationship between Ran and him because you know he he turns out he would have failed anyway, but. Um, yeah, it was a bit of diplomatic, yes, of course, you can come along. And that's something else you might want to consider if you've got someone who is pushing to invite themselves along on your expedition, rather than just saying no, is, well, yeah, let them apply, let them go through the process and um, what will be, will be, whether by accident or design. Um, so that's one benefit, not one you would automatically sort of think of. But then we move on to the things you will sort of learn about people by going away to a sort of create your, your bubble wherever you're running this and creating your um, scenario and situation um, where you can then learn more about these people, much more so than you would say with just a, an interview. 
things that you learn that you only really get from this sort of process and they, they can be really important one is timekeeping we had one person on the last one we did and this person lived five minutes behind everyone else and you wouldn't think well that's not such a big thing it really gets to great that everyone else is there on time with the right equipment ready to go and then they come wandering in with their their cup of tea like okay i'm here now you do not want that because out in the field two months down the road you will just be digging a ditch to leave them in um yeah the these are the things that you find out gradually as your selection process comes on and again uh their personal admin not just the timekeeping but if they are constantly living in a state of chaos with their kit and you've got everyone sort of bunched together in a confined space and they're just always losing the thing or never turn up for the task with the right piece of equipment and all of that you need to know and it will become fairly obvious pretty quickly that they just live in a state of, of chaos and they may be wonderful people but they're sort of dangerous to have around also things like mood swings um there was we were oh another thing that we've done together in the past was working with all these highly motivated doctors and surgeons in the build up to the world's biggest medical expedition to everest and we were in chamonix as part of the build up building the first lab and there was one highly motivated skilled person who said one morning don't talk to me until 10 o'clock in the morning and i've had two cups of coffee it's like well sorry but that isn't going to work um so you know the the moody people the up and down the unpredictable you don't need that but you that's something you need to create a scenario in which they can display their mood swings also when we run these weekends usually it is a weekend um we pile everyone in into a confined space and you know they do the cooking the cleaning the whatever whatever and you keep an eye out you know who is work basically work shy um who doesn't muck in and do the chores and do them properly rather than lip service when there's um someone watching them how well do they mix it's very uh very possible to have people who are brilliant in their own right but they really don't mix with others and that's just not good and you have to put them in that situation where they they need to mix and get on and occasionally bite their lip you want to find out who are the the dominant people who think that they uh should be in charge of any situation that they're in sometimes they're the ones with the right skills that they should be in charge of that task but on others they need to accept no 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 so and so is better at this than i am and the, you you find these out and we have tasks that uh, that weedle these things out sense of humor god you need one you're going to find yourself in absurd situations at all hours of the day of night and think how did my life come to this and if you can't have a laugh then you are wasting your time now you don't want a joker because that will will wear but someone who can just see the absurdity of situations and and move on very good your actual skills you know people are there to fulfill roles um so you need to check that they can do that and sort of demonstrate it in a in an appropriate way uh problem solvers people who can adapt to the bizarre situations that that come along or see a different way of solving something and that's something else we we set up to bring that out one important one are those people who are just a danger to other people yeah you know, they just charge at everything uh and don't think first and they are ones that you want to pick up and um you know filter out very early on now being a danger to others can come from all sorts of things like how they deal with the the gas ovens how they deal with parking vehicles how the a million and one ways that people can have accidents 
or injure other people by not thinking before they act. Um, and especially as they start to get tired. Um, you need people who can make decisions. Now you have a hierarchy, you have expedition leaders, but due to circumstance, illness, accident or whatever, those people could be either not there or incapacitated. So you need to find out whether your candidates, when required, can step up and make decisions and then also communicate those decisions. And we run specific tasks that are communication skills and things like that. Um, so these are all facets of people's personalities that we try to bring out. And they are the things that you will find out by running an extended uh, selection procedure. One interesting one, which we found out, or I found out on a 20 hour drive up to the Arctic Circle in a minibus, um, was one candidate for, uh, in fact, one of Rand's expeditions, had some, you know, few good stories about the Himalayas and, and things like that. And you think, oh yeah, that's, that's really good. Oh, you've been there and you, you've done these, these things, that's great. Turns out there was about three stories and over this 20 hour drive, they kept coming round and round and round and it just did your head in. And, um, you wouldn't have found that out with an interview. You only find that sort of thing out by an extended period and the sort of pressure environment. And then the other key benefit of a, using a third party, if you like, uh, or a team who are good at it to run a selection process for you, is we tend to then allow the expedition leader to not be busy and they're free just to float around and just observe and they're not down in the thick of it running things. They can just wander around and see people being busy doing their various tasks and have that bandwidth to uh, form their own opinions on people. Well, that was fascinating stuff. And I've certainly um, made errors in the past by not um, running a formal selection process and not using Steve for some projects. So one of them was when we beat the record for the fastest drive London to Cape Town. Um, in hindsight, poor decision, but I took my brother and an old Air Force mate of mine. Now, although we were successful, we completed the trip, we got the new world record. Uh, unfortunately, um, that old Air Force mate of mine he hasn't spoken to me and that since, and that was 10 years ago. And it did take quite a while for even my brother and me to kind of get back on speaking terms. So just really take heed of what Steve was saying there about doing it formally, ideally using a third party to run it. And uh, it just saves an awful lot of aggro that could follow years later. Uh, and it's, it ruined, you know, great relationships and great friendships with stuff I've done. So lesson that I've had to learn the hard way. So try not to do the same yourselves.